questions that children come up with, it's with you. Um, one child in swimming lessons asked the instructor, when do we learn how to breathe underwater? And that would be nice. Um, while baking cookies, one three-year-old asked her aunt, are the cookies loading? Uh, I guess that's a generational thing. <laughs> How about this one? Why don't crabs have eyebrows? I've never thought of that myself, actually. So, um, What is the name of the space between the bits that stick out on a comb? I don't know why you would even wonder what that is, but kids do. Um, what happens if you throw a tomato at the sun? Probably get lots of good answers to that one. Um, I like this one. Um, if Jesus doesn't have a sister, why do I have to have one? <laughs> the questions that kids ask can be, uh, can be funny. They can also be profound uh, in their own way. In the middle of dinner, out of the blue, one child asked their parents, what did it feel like on your last day of being a child? <laughs> oh, ooh. That's, I made me kind of mad if I, or sad if I thought about it. Or one last kid question, how do I know that I'm real and not just a dream of someone else? That's a pretty deep question. (laughs) Kids ask some great questions, don't they? Uh, Some of their questions we find entertaining because of just their innocence and uh, their their innocent view of the world, but some of them are quite piercing uh, because uh, kids tend to also ask questions that we as adults haven't even come up with with good answers for yet ourselves. But kids are honest about the fact that there's lots of stuff that they don't know. Uh, And they ask their questions of people who they believe have a good chance of of maybe having an answer. And so that in itself is a great life lesson that we can learn from our kids. Be humble, ask questions, ask somebody who's likely to know the answer. Uh, If we took a survey of everybody in the room this morning um, asking if you could go back in history to any point in time to ask anyone a question, who would you want to ask? I'm guessing that somewhere in the top three vote-getters this morning uh, might be Jesus. Um, At least I would hope so. I mean, we are in church after all. Um, In today's chapter in the story, Jesus officially begins his earthly ministry, and one of the things that that means happens is that he begins to be peppered with all kinds of questions. And so what I've done this morning is gone through this week's chapter in the story and picked out uh, a handful of questions that Jesus gets asked, good questions, uh, so that we can examine his answers to those questions and see what they have to teach us. So if you want to go ahead and again grab the bulletin that you got on the way in, uh, another one of the inserts is uh, the message notes. It says the story right across the top, and uh, that has the six questions listed there and where they're found in uh, the passages of the Bible that uh, they are found in the story this week. Uh, And please also take a moment to uh, fill out the communication envelope if you haven't yet done that uh, this morning. We'd appreciate that as a a great gift to us at the end of the service. Uh, In case you're new with us in the orchard, let me give you a quick rundown of uh, what we are studying as a church family this fall. This past spring, we kicked off this giant um, 31-week teaching series to cover the entire Bible from front to back um, using this little resource book called The Story. You may have seen it around. We have a, a table in the back that's got a bunch of them on it. And uh, what the story is, it's just an abridged version of the Bible that has been arranged chronologically uh, and then divided into 31 major chapters, which are completely different from the chapters that you would find in individual books in the full Bible, just so you know. Um, but it's, uh, it's an adaptation that helps us to get a better sense of where all of the people and places and events in the Bible fit together through the flow of history as God is working out His story. And just last week, we started into the New Testament portion of the story. And so we'd love for you to have a copy of these. They're, they go for 20 bucks in the store. We got them at bulk. They're only five bucks here. So make sure you grab a copy of the story before you leave this morning. You will find it to be a very valuable uh, resource. Uh, so if you're new with us, you've come into the story at a great place this week. Don has a few copies right there. If you want one, just a thumb through this morning as we, as we go, you can flag him down. Um, we are doing a super quick overview of the Bible. For those of you who have been here for very long, you've already noticed um, how many uh, hundreds of years sometimes we're covering in one week. It's just a flyby just to get the big picture of what uh, God is up to in the story of the Bible. Uh, And it's going to be the same thing in the New Testament. We're just taking a very um, sort of 30,000 foot view of the New Testament of Jesus and his disciples uh, and the church that, uh, that they started. Um, Jesus did lots of things, and the disciples did lots of things we're not going to be able to get to um, in the context of our Sunday mornings in small groups, but we hope that this will be a sort of whet your appetite to go and read more um, about the ministry of Jesus.
And so uh, this week's chapter in the story is chapter 23, and it's titled, Jesus' Ministry Begins. And let me take just a moment to break down what that word means. Uh, That's a very churchy word, the word ministry. When people hear that word, a lot of times they picture a guy standing in front of a a church service, maybe wearing a black and white, you know, collar-looking thing, uh, and that would be understandable, but that's not really what the word ministry in the Bible means. When the Bible uses this word ministry, it just means uh, it's a synonym for service, and not like a, a church service, like the normal use of the word service. It means helping other people out, meeting other people's needs, and that's really the best definition of uh, the Bible word for ministry. It's just meeting people's needs with God's love, and so that's what Jesus sets out to do in this chapter of the story. Um, He's launching his ministry into the world to fulfill what God sent him here to do, which is to meet humanity's deepest needs. And one of those needs that we all have is to have our questions answered. And uh, so that's exactly what Jesus does throughout this chapter. And he wants to do that for you and me today. He wants us to bring our big questions to him and seek his answers for us. Uh, In fact, Jesus is the only source of answers for the biggest questions that we have in life. And for those of us who are, who are called to follow Jesus, we are His ministers, and so it's part of our job to share um, His answers with the world using His love. So last week we briefly looked at the baby stories of Jesus, uh, sort of how His birth happened, what all surrounded that, and we saw that Jesus' arrival on planet Earth was intended to communicate, uh, among other th- things, three major lessons that God is with us, God is for us, and God is Jesus. And so now that you're all caught up on last week, let's jump into this week's uh, chapter in the story. Uh, The last time we saw Jesus at the end of the last chapter, he was uh, 12 years old. He was already teaching the religious leaders in the temple at Jerusalem, and now it's been 18 years since that scene, and Jesus is 30 years old when his cousin John the Baptist begins his preaching ministry, and that's where we pick up uh, this week's chapter in the story. It's on page 321, if you have your copy with you. And if you don't have uh, the story, but you have your Bible, um, you can turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and we'll begin reading in chapter 3. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And the story skips down to verse 13 where it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So here we have the first question that Jesus is asked in this chapter in the story. John says, I need to be baptized to you, and you come to me? Uh, It's probably a good idea to cover a little bit about uh, the history of baptism, that practice in the first century. At this point in Jewish history, baptism served uh, one of three purposes. Uh, First, there was the baptism of repentance. That's what uh, what, uh, John was preaching Uh, here. When Jews wanted to express uh, contrition for their sin uh, and demonstrate a desire to have a renewed commitment to the Lord, they would be baptized. But John knew Jesus. He knew that he was sinless, uh, and he didn't need to repent of anything, and so that's what prompts John's outburst here. Um, His thought process is, you know, if anything, it should be the other way around here. You should be the one baptizing me. Uh, But a second kind of baptism that was practiced in Jewish history uh, was for people who wanted to convert to Judaism uh, out of of pagan nations, and that was a baptism of conversion. A Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism was immersed in water, and according to the commentators, uh, the Jews were accustomed of saying of a heathen proselyte on his public admission into the Jewish faith by baptism that he was a newborn child. So baptism was a part of a new believer's conversion to Judaism uh, as well. But Jesus was already a Jew. He was born to Jewish parents. He was raised in the faith. So that's what, not what his baptism was about either. Uh, it was not for repentance. It was not for conversion. But there was one other category of people um, at this time in Jewish history um, who went through the practice of baptism, and those people were the priests. Um, In the book of Leviticus, we read that the high priest was washed with water to consecrate him and set him apart for the Lord's service. And so the temple actually had pools uh, in the courtyard that were set aside just for that 
uh, practice. So this baptism of initiation is what began the ministry of the priest, and they were marked with God's approval and empowered as God's representatives uh, in the washing process. And so this is the reason for Jesus' baptism specifically. His ministry is being inaugurated, is being launched, is being kicked off. And notice Jesus' answer to John's objection that John put in the form of a question. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So Jesus is saying this is the right thing to do in the eyes of God. Jesus was setting an example for us to follow. Um, And it actually happens to be that Christian baptism actually fulfills all three roles of what was practiced Uh, in the baptism of the day. Christian baptism is a baptism of repentance for the washing away of sins, and as Peter says on uh, on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, it's a baptism of conversion, as Paul says when he writes that we are baptized into Christ. And it's also a baptism of initiation, as Peter writes that we who belong to Christ are a holy priesthood. And I I mentioned before that I love the little saying, uh, when we come out of the baptistry, we enter the ministry. And that's absolutely true because God saves us to serve, to follow the example of Jesus. So we have three times the reason that Jesus did um, for being baptized, for doing what God calls us to do. And look at what happens next in the passage. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, I've never been to a baptism where the heavens opened up and we literally heard the voice of God, uh, but I can tell you that every baptism that I have been at is one where God says, I am well pleased. So here's the first blank in your message notes. If you're following along, uh, playing the fill in the blank game, um, the first answer that Jesus gives to a question is, We start where God says. If you are a believer in Jesus, but you haven't been baptized yet, you need to start where God says. That's what Jesus did. And the next thing I want us to look at briefly is a few more pages into the chapter in the story. It's at the bottom half of page 326 um, in your copy of the story. In your Bible, it's in John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And here we see the second question I want us to look at. Nicodemus then asks Jesus, how can someone be born when they are old? And that is a really good question, if you ask me. Um, I know a lot of mothers who would not want to give birth if the baby was any older than it was already. Um, (laughs) What does it mean to be born again? Well, we read on in the passage, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Jesus says it's about a lot more than just getting wet in baptism. Entering God's kingdom is an inside-out proposition. It's about being reborn on the inside. It's about opening my heart up for God's Spirit to move in and take up residency inside of me. Well, how does one do that? Jesus goes on to elaborate for Nicodemus. A few verses later in a passage that contains probably the most well-known words uh, in all of the Bible, uh, at the bottom of page 327 uh, in the story, or John 3, 15, says, "...the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, did you notice anything about an age restriction in that little passage from Jesus? Um, It's not there. Um, At what age is a person too far gone for Jesus to save? It's not there. Nicodemus asks, how can someone be born when they are old? And Jesus answers with, everyone who believes may have eternal life. Whoever believes shall not 
perish. So here's my summary of Jesus' answer uh, to Nicodemus here. It's the second blank in your notes. Jesus says, it's never too late to start over with God. It is never too late. I came across a a neat poem this past week that uses each phrase from John 3.16 in the the King James Version um, as the basis of the poem, and uh, it it does a really good job of explaining uh, the entire good news of Jesus. It says, For God, the Lord of earth and heaven, so loved and longed to see forgiven, the world in sin and pleasure mad, that he gave the only son he had, his only son to take our place, that whosoever, oh what grace, believeth placing simple trust in him the righteous and the just, should not perish lost in sin, but have everlasting life in him. We need to start where God says to start, and it's never too late to get started over with God. A third question I want us to look at briefly is in an encounter that Jesus has recorded just in the very next chapter in in John's gospel, in chapter 4. In the story, it's uh, at the bottom of 327. It goes on to say, now he, speaking of Jesus, had, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Uh, This lady is just full of questions. She's she's asked three questions in the span of four sentences here. Um, Her story probably deserves a little bit more elaboration as well. First, because she is a woman, the fact that Jesus opened up a conversation with her in public um, would have been a little shocking at the time on its own because women were considered second-class citizens in that day and age, and men did not generally speak to women in public that they were not related to. Um, Also, much has been made by the uh, biblical commentators of the fact that this woman was by herself drawing water from the well um, at the heat of high noon. And it's likely that the rest of the women from town did that first thing in the morning while it was still cool out. So whether by their choice or by hers, um, she is somewhat of a social outcast. Then you add to that fact that she is a Samaritan. The Samaritans were the people that were descended um, from the intermarriage of the faithless Jews of northern Israel that we talked about several weeks ago uh, when the northern kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians and the people were hauled away and the king of Assyria put a bunch of uh, his own people and pagans from other lands in there and the Jews that were left intermarried and uh, became what was referred to as the Samaritans. And so according to the Jewish way of looking at things, she's also um, a half-breed, if you will. And as it will come up later in Jesus' conversation with her, she's been married five times, and the guy that she's currently shacking up with, she is not married to either. This lady is a poster child for rejection. She's been rejected by the Jews, rejected by the women of her town, rejected by men in general, and rejected by five ex-husbands in particular. It's safe to say that her life for some time has been about grasping at straws of hope trying to find a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a better life somewhere. And to that end, she even dabbled in religion uh, later in trying to turn the topic of conversation away from her personal life to, you know, more general conversation. Uh, She brings up some, some generic religious questions. You know, we too as human beings tend to look in all sorts of places uh, for things that will give us hope and give our life meaning. Things like success and money and cool toys. And just like this Samaritan woman sometimes in romantic relationships and in social status and even by dabbling in religion now and again. But none of these things ultimately satisfies and we're left as the Samaritan woman feeling dejected. And once again, Jesus addresses her real need, and he says, everyone who drinks this water 
will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus has the same exact message to those of us today who are grasping for hope wherever we can find it. As I read this uh, passage about Jesus fulfilling the thirst uh, in us that nothing else can, I couldn't help but think about um, those TV commercials for Dos Equis beer. You know those? With the most interesting man in the world. You've seen these, right? Uh, and what's the tagline at the end of every commercial? Stay thirsty, my friends, right? The guy's hilarious. I love him. Uh, Jesus Christ is actually, literally, the most interesting man in the world, okay? And uh, I can imagine that as long as we are looking for our ultimate fulfillment in anything and anyone other than Him, I can just hear Him smiling and saying, stay thirsty, my friends. He's there for us, okay? My summary of Jesus' answer to the Samaritan woman uh, is, Jesus says, I can give you eternal life. You're not going to find that anywhere else, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much you achieve. Jesus says, I can give you eternal life. The next scene where Jesus answers a question is at the bottom of page 330 in the story, or Mark chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, it says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Again, I think that's a great question because sin is about breaking our fellowship with God. But Jesus is so good that he didn't even have to hear them ask the question out loud. Reading on, it says, Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. I think that's probably one of the top ten understatements of the Bible there. This amazed everyone. A paralyzed man has gotten up and walked out. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Jesus' answer to these men was self-explanatory by the miraculous healing that he performed, and so his answer to them is, Jesus says, I can both heal and forgive. And immediately here in Mark 2, Jesus is questioned again by self-righteous religious leaders. Starting in verse 13, it says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Big question in their day. And Jesus' answer to the Pharisees is as pointed and full of grace as it could be. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." One saying that has arisen from Jesus' teaching right here is that the church ought to be less of a museum for saints and more of a hospital for sinners. Uh, It's easy for a church to lose focus, though. Um, Over time, as a church gets large large enough to meet its own needs, to take care of itself, uh, sometimes it begins to lose focus on the very reason that the church exists and is here. I want you to know that my heart for the orchard is that we never lose that focus. I really, truly want us as a church family to be accused, as Jesus was, of being a friend of tax collectors and sinners, the people that society looks over and leaves out and leaves behind. So my summary of Jesus' answer 
to these Pharisees is that Jesus says, I'm here for people who need me most. Final question I want us to look at from this chapter in the story is found on the last page of the chapter. It's page 334. It's taken from Matthew chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 2. It says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, this is the very same John who just a few pages earlier um, had inaugurated Jesus into ministry by baptizing him. He saw the heavens open up. He heard the voice of God. But now, because of John's preaching about repentance and the kingdom of heaven that was coming near in Jesus, he's been snatched up by an angry government ruler and thrown into prison for it. So now he's questioning his faith. He's questioning his decisions. What does he really believe? Has he thrown his life away for nothing? Is, is this Jesus the real deal? I guess prison will, ask you, will make you ask tough questions um, about your life, won't it? Uh, but it doesn't really even take prison. Any hardship that we encounter in our life causes us to really reevaluate what we believe. When I was fired from my ministry in a previous church, it took me uh, a while, for sure, to work through my reevaluation of things. But it's in these times when we're struggling and tempted to doubt our faith that we need to be reminded of what we already know to be true. That's what Jesus does for John right here. Jesus points him back to the Scriptures, points him to Jesus' fulfillment of them. And while it's not contained in this chapter of the story, back in Luke 4, in one of Jesus' first teaching appearances in front of the public, it says, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood to read the Scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the eyes in the synagogue looked at Him intently. Then He began to speak to them. The Scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus points John back to this scene, back to his baptism and the fulfillment of these scriptures when he sends this answer back to John here at the end of this chapter in the story. In Matthew eleven four. 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus' answer to John's question from his place of doubt is a very simple one. Jesus says, I am the one you can trust in me. You know, Jesus has the answers to life's biggest questions. How can I start over with God? Is it too late for me? Where can I find real life? Can God ever forgive me? Will God really accept me? Jesus answers all of these questions and more. The smart thing for us to do is to come, as Jesus said, like a child, humbly asking questions, asking the one who has all the answers. The band is going to come back up and lead us uh, in a song uh, to help us prepare for a communion time. Ultimately, the answers that Jesus provides go far beyond His words, what He spoke. Jesus literally became the answer to our biggest need when He surrendered His life by dying on the cross for you and me to pay the penalty that our sins deserve. Jesus became the answer to our greatest need, and that's what we celebrate every Sunday in our communion time. Uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to participate with us. Um, as this next song is played, the ushers are going to pass a tray of communion elements down your row. Uh, in the top cup is a little, uh, or is a bit of juice that reminds us of Jesus' blood, and the bottom cup is a little bit of bread that reminds us of His body. And just hold on to those cups, and after everyone's been served at the end of the song, um, I'll come back up and lead us as we remember uh, Jesus, the ultimate answer uh, to our questions and to our needs. Let's pray.
God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the honest portrayal we find there of broken people, of people who uh, dress funny and live out in the desert, of people who are influential and have to be worried about their reputation, people whose marriages uh, have fallen apart, people who are suffering and in doubt. God, it encourages us that you came to be with, to speak to, and to love each and every one of those and each and every one of us. God, we thank you that you provide the answers to the deepest longings of our heart, that you made us to love us, that you have a good plan for our life, that you want to adopt us into your family. And God, we thank you that Jesus was willing to go to the cross to purchase our freedom from the penalty of our sins to make all that happen. So God, as we pause this morning remembering your son, the answers that he gives us, we thank you that he is the ultimate answer to our need. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.